Welcome to the Dark Whales Tours podcast. On this podcast, we will explore the vast history of Wales, looking at the myths, legends, and ghosts of this magical and mystical country. Wales has been the heart of Britain's supernatural beliefs for many centuries, and on this episode, we will look at how omens of death have played an important part not only in Welsh history, but throughout the entire world. Are we really able to foretell our ultimate fate? There have been many different ways over the centuries that people have tried to foretell the future and find out the cause and timing of their death. The ancient Greeks used the stars and constellations to try and predict future events while also using Pythia, the high priestess of the Temple of Apollo, otherwise known as the Oracle of Delphi. It was her job to try to find out the will of the gods, to find out when was a good time to go to war, and also try to find out who would survive it. Greek mythology has numerous references to psychics who had the power to see the future, one of the most famous being Cassandra. Cassandra was the daughter of the king of Troy, who was gifted the power of prophecy by the god Apollo, who was in love with her. But when she refused his advances, Apollo cursed Cassandra to be able to see the future, but would never be believed. The myth goes on to say that Cassandra foresaw the fall of Troy and the death of everyone inside. When she tried to warn the people, they turned on her and shunned her. A few years later, of course, Troy did indeed fall to the Greek army. Had the Trojans heeded the warnings of Cassandra, they might have been able to save themselves and their city. It is not, however, just ancient civilizations who believed in the power of prophecy. In medieval and Tudor Britain, many aristocrats would hire soothsayers and wise men that would use charts of the stars to try to predict when their clients, and more importantly, their enemies, would die. This was the case with George, Duke of Clarence, who used an astronomer named John Stacey to predict the death of his brother, King Edward IV. This, of course, was treason and led to Stacey being arrested and hanged at Tyburn. George himself was put on trial and found guilty of treason against his brother, the King. His execution was held in the Tower of London on the 18th of February, 1478. Legend even goes as far as to say he was drowned in a butt of Malmsey wine. Now, George was not the last member of the royal family to try and predict future events. Queen Elizabeth I used astrologer and occultist John Dee, whose parents were of Welsh descent, to try to help predict the future. Dee himself is credited with predicting the rise of the British Empire, a term which it is thought he himself coined. The Queen highly valued Dee and sought his advice during various moments of her reign, including during the Spanish Armada. Dee was always careful not to predict the Queen's death, as again this would be seen as treason and would have led him to be executed just like John Stacey. Death is, however, the one thing in life that is guaranteed to come to us all. Did these ancient and medieval astrologers have the knowledge that allowed them to see signs that warned of future death? Is it actually possible to know when death is coming. Here in Wales we have a variety of different death omens that have been passed down throughout the centuries, ranging from small lights to full manifestations of future funerals. In this episode I will talk about some of the death omens that are spoken of here in Wales. One of the simplest forms that are known in Wales is the tolaith. Strange sounds and noises that are said to come from the homes and the rooms of those that are soon to die. These sounds were often described as knocks, bangs, taps and sometimes footsteps that can't be explained or accounted for. Soon after these sounds were heard, it was always reported that someone in the house would soon die. 
It was often said these sounds were symbolic of the nails being hammered into the coffin of the soon to be deceased. There is a story from an inn in the seaside town of Puffcall, where a guest was unnerved one day after hearing the clear sound of approaching footsteps and tapping noises coming from the table in the parlour. These sounds were accompanied by the feeling that he was no longer alone. The following day, a group of local fishermen came to the inn carrying with them a body of a colleague of theirs who had suffered an accident at sea. They walked right through the inn and placed the body on the parlour table where he was pronounced dead. Could the guest somehow have had a premonition of the group of fishermen bringing the body of the dead colleague? Or were these sounds an alert or warning perhaps of the death soon to come to the inn? A more well-known form these omens of death are said to take is something that has been reported and spoken of all over the world for many centuries. Small balls of light, often described as small candle flames, but of course without the wick and without the stem. These lights are still talked about to this very day. Every country in the world is said to have their own name for them, and they interpret them in many different ways. In England, and much of Europe, the name given to these lights is the Will of the Wisp. These balls of light are said not only to warn of future death, but have also been known to try and bring about death themselves. It is said these lights would appear at the edge of cliffs or in boggy marshlands and try to tempt people into danger. In Ireland, they call them jack-o'-lanterns, a tradition and name that the Irish took over to America. Here in Wales, these balls of light are called Carnalf Corf, which translates to corpse candles. These corpse candles in Wales were said to issue from the home of a person who was soon to die, to travel from their home to the graveyard where the person will be soon be buried. It was even said they were known to float and hover around the unmarked graves of murder victims waiting to be discovered. In 1627, in a small village in Anglesey, a man moved into a farmhouse that had only recently been vacated by the previous owner, who had left in a hurry. During the night, the new owner was awoken by a bright light coming from the end of his bed. He was overcome with a sense of trust. He knew somehow in his heart the light meant him no harm. So intrigued, he rose from his bed and the light started to move out of the door and through the house. Almost hypnotically, the man followed. The light began moving further through the house towards the back door. The man followed it outside and the light then led him to a small mound at the back of the property. After this had happened several times, the man asked a number of people in the village to accompany him to see if they too could witness this strange phenomenon. The light appeared as usual, so the villagers followed it, and when the light once again settled on the mound, one of the villagers recalled seeing the previous owner the night before he left, hanging around the back of the house around the location of the mound. But well, of course, this led to suspicion, and the decision was made to dig up the mound, which revealed the body of a murdered man. The body was that of a local farmer, who had gone missing. The villagers believed that the lights were somehow trying to tell everyone where the body lay, so justice could be done. The previous owner of the house was tracked down and found in Bristol. He was returned to Wales for trial where he was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. The Canal of Corf had not only informed the house's new occupants of the death, but also they showed them where the body was buried so the murder could be uncovered and solved. Or perhaps could the lights actually have been some remnant of the murdered farmer's spirit, returning to see justice served? There is a theory that these lights are indeed the souls of the dead, coming back to our world but not having the power to appear in full form. 
it can only manifest and appear as simple balls of light. Even in the 21st century, these balls of light, more commonly referred to as orbs, are still seen all around the world. They have become one of the most common ways people are able to capture what could be spirits in photographs. Ever since photography became mainstream, there have been reports of these orbs being captured and a simple online search will reveal thousands of them. There is, of course, a huge debate over whether or not these orbs are natural occurrences or something more paranormal. Could they really be the souls of the long dead? Or could they simply be explained by science? Could they just perhaps be the flare of the camera, dust on the lens, the flash being reflected back perhaps? On the occasions where they have been spotted with the naked eye, could this just be gases rising from the earth and igniting before our very eyes? Could they be reflections of the sun or the moon on water or through glass? Or simply just our imagination playing tricks on us? However, before the advent of science and technology, people only had religion and superstition to explain the world around them. So it's no surprise that they looked for signs that the end was near so they could put their affairs in order and try to prepare for death. Welsh legends go even further than most by saying that Saint David, the patron saint of Wales, asked God to warn his people that death was coming, so they had chance to set their affairs in order and to see to the health of their souls. According to the legend, God agreed, and so granted these death omens unto the Welsh, so they could have enough warning of their imminent death. But if they were able to read and understand these signs, then they could perhaps in some cases potentially avoid dangerous situations in the first place, situations that would bring about death before that person was ready to go. It is a comfort to some to think that their loved ones can come back to warn them of danger, but not all of these warnings are meant for the person who witnesses the event. A strange way of finding out who was soon to die would be to witness the phantom funeral. A vision of a funeral that was so real you could make out exactly who was in attendance, thus being able to work out who was soon to die. There are reports of these funerals being so vivid and so real that people were pushed to the side of the road by the phantom figures that were making their way to the church. One such account happened in 1871 in the small North Wales town of Bethesda on the edge of Snowdonia. A lady was walking past the church and suddenly found herself being jostled by a mass of mourners, some of whom she recognised as they made their way toward the church. She found this rather strange as she hadn't heard of any local deaths or of a funeral due to take place that day. Somewhat intrigued, the lady followed the figures towards the churchyard. As she reached the gate of the churchyard, she was startled by the sound of a horse reining in terror and realised suddenly all the people she had previously seen were gone. The churchyard was completely empty. She looked around and there was no sign of a horse in the vicinity or anywhere so many people could have gone. They had simply vanished into thin air. Confused, the poor lady ran home in fright. She retold her tale to her friends, who tried to find some reasonable explanation, but they too were equally bewildered. The lady tried to forget the experience and put it behind her. A few weeks later, one of the lady's friends sadly passed away and as the lady made her way to the church for the service, she suddenly had a sense of deja vu. She had seen all of this before. As she was about to turn to walk up the church's path, she started to feel more and more uneasy. She heard the sound of a horse's hooves on the road, and turning, she saw the carriage which held the coffin pulling up. The lady's unease began to grow, when suddenly a dog started barking. <coughs> scaring the horse who pulled the coffin, making it wheel up in terror. The lady and her friends couldn't believe it. She was convinced she had had a vision 
of this very moment weeks before it had happened. Every detail was exactly as she remembered. The phantom funeral has also been experienced throughout the whole of Europe, mainly in Germany and Switzerland, but it seems to be rife here in Wales more than anywhere else, with countless other similar tales coming from all corners of the country. Another name for this is the fairy funeral, as it was once said that the vision had been sent by the fair folk to warn or just to try to unsettle the humans. It is not just, however, spectral beings that are said to be able to foretell death. For centuries, the Welsh have talked of the Adedin Corf, the corpse bird. This death bird is said to fly onto the window of the soon-to-be deceased and peck at the window as a warning that death is coming. There are many stories from Welsh history of these birds foretelling death, with the descriptions of these birds differing from story to story. Some describe them as large, black, menacing birds, and others say the corpse bird was smaller and brown, but still with an air of something not quite right about it. The stories also differ as to how the corpse bird warns of death, with some stories going as far as to say the Adelian Corf calls out, Dewch, Dewch, translating from Welsh, meaning come, come, beckoning to the soul of the soon-to-be departed to follow them into the afterlife. A colleague of ours, in fact, from St. Fagan's National Museum of History in Wales, told us a story from when he was a young boy. For many days he had said a magpie had pecked relentlessly at one of the windows of the family home. His mother was convinced that this could only mean bad news, that something awful would soon befall the family. She was sure that death was on its way. After about a week or so of the magpie's incessant pecking, our colleague's grandmother sadly passed away. The magpie never returned after the death had struck the family. Of course, at the time, as a young boy, he thought nothing of his mother's superstitious belief. But as he grew up and heard countless other similar tales all over the country, he has since questioned whether or not there was any truth to it. Birds have always been important to our belief systems. The Egyptians had the falcon-headed god Horus. The Greeks saw the owl as the companion to the goddess Athena, and the Native Americans saw the eagle as an important sacred bird. Some birds were seen as being lucky for some while bringing death and destruction to others. For example, it was said in England that if a swallow flew into your home, it would bring with it luck, and if it made its nest under the house, it would protect the house from fire and lightning. In Scotland, however, the swallow was seen as a bad omen and was believed to have the devil's blood run through its veins. Even the most sacred of birds, the dove, could be a death omen, as it was said if a dove was seen circling over someone's head, that person was soon to die. One of the more frightening omens of death is something that is said to call out to the soon-to-be deceased, something known in Wales as the Cahiraith, or the Wailing. This creature is said to have a high-pitched screech which fills those who hear it with fear and dread. Some even say that it calls out the names of those who are soon to die. This has been heard outside of a house where someone is soon to die, or moving along the street, which would mean many people in the village would soon pass away. If the wailing was heard near the sea, it would predict a shipwreck or disaster at sea. Most people today are more familiar with the Irish version of this creature, the Banshee. There are many accounts of people over the centuries reporting, hearing, moaning and wailing just before death is about to strike. One night, a lady was alone in her house. Her husband had just left to go to work down the mine. The lady was sat by the fireplace, slowly drifting off to sleep, when all of a sudden, she was startled by a high-pitched scream. Frozen to her chair, the lady was filled with terror when she heard the scream for a second time, coming from the direction of the front door. 
Knowing the stories of the Kahiraith, the lady feared the worst and listened in horror as she heard the creature call out her husband's name from behind the front door. In a moment of panic, the lady ran to the door and flung it open, only to be greeted by darkness. The lady stayed awake for the rest of the night, terrified and in fear for her husband, all the while hearing the screams of the Kahiraith sounding all around her. The next morning, the lady heard a knock at the door, and it was the news that she had dreaded. She opened the door to find her husband's colleagues carrying his body. They explained that during the night there had been an accident in the mine and her husband had not survived. The lady knew that the Kahirith had come to prepare her for her husband's death. There are some omens, however, that were only said to have been experienced in certain places, such as the blood in Corf, or known as death flowers, which were commonly experienced in the dark Welsh tunnels of the mines. These phantom smells were described as a sweet rose-like perfume which was said to alert the miners of danger and death that would follow in the coming days. A well-documented case of this was from 1890, the Morva mine disaster near Patolbert in South Wales. For a number of weeks, the miners had been reporting a number of strange occurrences, including these sweet smells coming from the pit, bringing with them a sense of dread. As the days went on, more and more the miners began to experience strange phenomena, such as seeing birds circling the pit head for no apparent reason, making a few of the miners comment that could these be the dead in Corf come to warn them that death was on its way. Some of the miners working deep in the pit actually said they saw the Canolf Corf, the lights floating through the mine, circling some of the workers, but not others. They also reported hearing the screams and cries for help and the sound of falling earth when there was no one present. On the 10th of March, half of the miners refused to go to work, saying that all these omens had been leading up to something, building up to some big disaster which would be fatal. Tragically, their fears were proven right, as there was an explosion at the mine later that day, bringing it down and killing 87 of the miners. Those death omens had seemingly saved the lives of those who had heeded their warnings and stayed away. Is this a tragic coincidence perhaps? Or does this and other cases prove the existence of these strange death omens? So is there any real credence in these signs? Or is it simply the superstitious beliefs and overactive imagination of our ancestors long before us? As I mentioned, centuries ago, people wholeheartedly believed in these omens as signs of bad news. You can just imagine the fear and dread they would have felt having experienced such things. The scientific world now, of course, has altered the way we see reality. These things can more often or not be given logical explanations. Or could it be those advancements that we hold so dear to us have actually masked our desires and capability in looking at such signs? Are they actually really there? But our minds rationalize us to tell us that they aren't. Such omens enable us to believe that there is a higher power that can warn us of danger and possibly help us prevent death before our time. Death is a subject that has intrigued, fascinated and terrified mankind the world over for millennia. It is the one thing that connects us all. Death is inevitable. And whether you're a king or a commoner, we will all one day die. Throughout our other episodes, we explore the ideas of what might happen after death. Can we come back to help loved ones? Are there such a thing as ghosts, or can it all be explained by science and logic? Whether or not we choose to believe in such things as death omens today is of course a matter of opinion. But there is no denying the fact that omens of death have been prevalent in our culture, like many others, for many centuries. They have played 
an important part in shaping Welsh history and have transcended through the centuries. Many of us, even today, will still practice and observe certain superstitions. We may have science and technology to help us explain the world, but we still hold our superstitions tight to our chests. And it is actually our willingness as a nation in embracing our past and our old beliefs which gives Wales a unique reputation as being a land of myth and tradition and said to be one of the most haunted countries in the world. So what is your opinion on these death omens? Are they real or just our imagination? If you have your own story to share on this or any of the topics in our podcasts, then please email us on darkwales at hotmail.com. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Dark Wales Tours podcast. Please be sure to visit us on www.darkwalestours.co.uk and also check out our Instagram, Facebook and Twitter feeds for news of our tours that we conduct in various locations around Wales and also for news of more episodes of this podcast. Until next time, Diolch Val, thank you very much. The Dark Wales Tours podcast is produced and delivered by Matthew Rose and Luke Alcock, owners of Dark Wales Tours.